Good morning. These lights are always so bright, I can never see everybody that's out there, and, and yet I'm really looking forward to uh, the morning and sharing some comments, and, and I promise you I didn't actually pay Colin to, to, to say such nice things. So um, I hope you've enjoyed the morning so far. What we're going to talk about uh, in this short section is what it means to plan for surprise. All right, I'm going to talk about what that means. But before I do, I just want to say that, that um, I'm really glad that this conference exists. I think that Tim is trying to do something unique as he brings together Strata RX, um, because I think he means it when he says, let's work on what matters. So obviously, healthcare matters. And there's a lot of people that are working on it. And yet, when I look at all of the effort and all the activity, there are times when I wonder, are we actually making any progress? Or do we face what one of my favorite cartoon characters, Pogo Possum, calls insurmountable opportunities. So when you look at the work in healthcare, I see a lot of different things. And some of it is actually about repair. It's about fixing things. But there's a lot more that we're doing, which is about redesign. It's not that the health system is broken. It's that we just don't really like the way that it works. And so what we're trying to do is to actually change the situation to something that's a lot more preferable. Now, when it comes to big data, while there are opportunities for big data to help in redesign, I think the biggest opportunities for big data actually come when we reimagine. So to reimagine, to actually create something brand new that begins, that actually starts with a change in perspective, like how we reimagine computers. When you look at that machine that's on your left, and I'm old enough to actually say that I owned one of those things. How many people out there actually owned one of those? There we see them. So we actually went from the machines that are on the left to what is now in your pocket, the machine on the right. And it involved a lot of science and technology. But before that, at its core, was a shift in perspective that reimagined them as being something more than for computation and actually core for communication. And I would posit that the opportunities for big data in healthcare actually come with this same type of shift, that it begins with a shift and how we come to actually know something. So I thought about this as I was reading Harvard Business Review's latest issue. The entire issue, called Getting Control of Big Data, um, is dedicated to this topic. And it, like the computer shift. It was, it's not about science and technology. What they're really talking about is more about the cultural shifts that we need and that we'll make, and in particular around decision making. And the lead article actually called big data, um, said it would be a management revolution. And as I read this article, it said, we're actually going to go from asking, what do we think, which is based on intuition, to starting to ask, what do we know? And it turns out that knowing things is kind of hard, at least in medicine and healthcare. So I also read two articles. Each of these actually came out last year. The first one was uh, in the Wall Street Journal. And its headline says, Mistakes in Scientific Studies Surge. And so it's focusing on mistakes. And so on the one hand, you could say it's good that we're saying, oh, we've made a mistake. But when studies are retracted, sometimes the effects don't go away. And so what was amazing about this article was not just that mistakes are being made and oops, my bad, but was the increase in the number of retractions. So over this period of time, what you're looking at here, which is about 10 years, the number of publications had increased about 40, 45 percent. And yet the increase in retractions had gone up 15-fold, which is amazing. What's also interesting was to read some of their theories about those retractions. So why all the backpedaling? And some, they said, journals are getting better at finding uh, errors and mistakes. And some of the reasons they said were that you know, it's actually easy to uncover plagiarism than it used to be. And some actually said it was out and out fraud. And so this was kind of a sinister view of why all the mistakes. And yet across the pond, there was another article that same year that said, you know, it's not quite so sinister. It turns out we actually just get things wrong. Right? 
The headline here in The Guardian was, Studies of Studies Show We Get Things Wrong. Well, really? And yet it was a fascinating review. This was uh, a synthesis of two recent studies that had actually analyzed all of the landmark research on clinical effectiveness. Over the last, one of them actually went back 15 years. But both of these studies drew the same conclusion, which was about only half of these landmark studies actually hold the test of time. And the rest of them? It's split. On some of them, we actually reversed the conclusion outright, going from, oh, this works really, really well, to, oops, sorry, it actually doesn't work at all, or sometimes it's harmful. Some were also supported, but to a lesser extent, and some were kind of inconclusive, reaching this, yeah, I don't know. I used to think yes, but maybe I don't know, and some actually hadn't been challenged yet. This picture in the bottom, this is kind of the, the John Wanamaker of healthcare. This is Dr. David Sackett, and he has a quote that, that is often shared and repeated around, something he says to, to students in medical school. It says, half of what you learn in medical school will be shown to be either dead wrong or out of date five years after you graduate. And so both of these articles point to the fact that essentially, first, Mark Twain's right. Mark Twain said, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know that just ain't so. And it turns out there's a lot of that what we know today that just ain't so. And what these studies point to is the fact that first, there is never, ever an excuse to stop monitoring outcomes. We should always be looking because even with the best of intentions, if we think that we're right five years from now, we may not be right. And second, is that if we did in fact pursue this actively, that such medical reversals could actually become quite common. And yet to do that, what I would suggest is that we need two things. The first is that we need a way to find things we're not actually looking for. And the second is that we have to get much better at being wrong. And so what I want to do today is to share with you an example of the first and then pause it that by getting better at that, we'll actually get better at being wrong. So I want to share a story. I want to share some work that we actually did at GNS. And when you ask me, so who is GNS? And yes, we do big data analytics. In this context, I'd say we create knowledge that companies need but weren't actually looking for. How do we do that? A technical explanation is that we do hypothesis-free discovery of cause and effect relationships directly and at scale from observational data. And when we tell companies that we do this, we usually get one of three responses. Some companies say, ooh, cool. Other companies go, huh? But a third one said, show me. And that's what we did. So here's the setup. All right, this company, a very innovative healthcare company, actually had a national reputation in research and a portfolio of publications and a very rich set of data assets. And in fact, they had recently published on a drug-drug interaction. Their goal was that they wanted to expand their own ability to kind of see into their blind spot. They wanted to expand their ability to find what they weren't looking for and discover important results. They were frustrated by the time it was required to do the research the way they were doing it, and they were concerned about the questions that they weren't actually asking. And so they wanted to test this GNS approach. And what they said was, try to reproduce our finding, all right, and explore evidence of anything else that we haven't asked. So that's what we want you to do. The data they had, usual suspects, Three years of detailed claims data, it had the usual ICD-9 and CPT-4 and NDC codes in it. It also had patients that were re relevant to their recent publication and finding. And they said, okay, here's your challenge. I want you to reproduce what I did, all right, and you have to do it while blindfolded. And you go, well, what does that mean? You have to identify the causal links in this data between these drugs and outcomes, like we did, but the data will be blinded in that all the codes that you get will be dummies. And they did that for two reasons. The first reason was so we wouldn't cheat, right? 
this had already been published. And so it'd be real easy for us to go through and say, hey, look what I found. I recovered your finding because I knew what I was looking for. Uh, so they blinded it for that reason. The other reason they did it was because we told them that the platform that we have was data agnostic and built on a mathematics that actually didn't care about the kind of data. And so they said, all right, put your analytic money where your mouth is. And so we did. So what was this data? Was it big data? Here's what it was. It wasn't huge. About 110,000 patients over three years of time. We had just shy of 60 million transactions. And these were the number of diagnosis codes and procedure codes and drug codes that we had. Now, we didn't know what those codes were, but we could count up how many unique ones were there. So that isn't really what people think of as big data. But when you think about research and you think about cause-effect relationships, it's not how many records you have. It's how many hypotheses can be formed. And in this case, it was 45 quadrillion hypotheses that were possible from this example, from this data set, and these people. It's really tough to imagine how big a quadrillion is. And so if I said a penny for your thoughts, or in this case, a penny for your hypothesis, how big is that? It turns out there is a picture of how big that is. This is one quadrillion pennies. This is a cube that is a half a mile. The actual hypothesis space was 45 of these, which, if you lay them end to end, probably covers the island of Manhattan. So this is a very, very large space. Now, in terms of the approach, this is what we did. We searched this space exhaustively. We said, we're going to model the time ordering and the interplay of all these events and exposures. We're going to automatically identify these causal drivers and adjust for all the biases that you need to in order to make sure your findings are relevant. We're going to preserve this uncertainty because all of this, of course, is probabilistic. right? And we're going to do it really, really fast. And so that's what we did. And here's what we found. So out of that total hypothesis space, Yes, along the way, we detected correlations. But the bottom line answer was that we found inside about 400 causal relationships that were worth looking at. Think of this as hypothesis discovery, if you like. But along the way, to go from a massive space to a meaningful few clearly showed the power of the approach. We also, within that meaningful few, reproduced their finding. So when we handed these study results back, they were still blinded. But when they unwrapped the package, they found that we had recovered it. They also found a few things that they weren't looking for. And there was a notable surprise. And the notable surprise was a possible adverse effect for a commonly prescribed drug. This effect they said, well, we want, to, we want to see if this is real. And so immediately set about trying to reproduce it. And, hit, and that's been done in two out of sample data sets. Um, but we're also pursuing additional validation, no blindfolds this time. So I think the power of the result, if you think about it, this is not about doing this work and doing it blindfolded. It's about the opportunity to reimagine knowledge discovery, so the big data rather than being a burden, actually becomes a bonanza. When you think about the data that Colin talked about in his opening remarks, it's not just the data that we have today. There are entire companies and entire industries focused on creating more data tomorrow. These hypothesis spaces aren't going to get any smaller. And in fact, we're fighting for them to get bigger. We don't have enough time, enough manpower, or enough energy to comb through the number of potentially distinct hypotheses that we could draw so that we can get to the meaningful few that can help us know what we weren't looking for but need to know. And if we can do that, I think that we can, in fact, help with the second challenge, which is to get better at being wrong by making it easier to find what's right. This book, if you haven't read it, is an absolute delight. It's a fascinating tour of human fallibility. 
And it's, she actually comes up with a new way of looking at wrongness. Rather than being pessimistic, she's very optimistic and actually sees our capacity to err as inseparable from our imagination. And she actually links it to human creativity, and in particular, to how we generate and revise our beliefs about the world. And that's really what we're talking about. Through hypothesis-free discovery using big data, I think that we can generate and revise our beliefs in fundamentally different ways. And with those new ways, I think we get better at being wrong and just perhaps can unleash this creativity she's talking about in healthcare. Thank you.